morning. Good morning. So today I'm going to talk about symbols of the self, and this is one of the most important concepts in Jungian psychology, and therefore I want to help you understand it and to understand how archetypal it is. And so I'm going to be showing you how, um, how important it is in many different species, not only human beings. And so I'm going to begin uh, by, reading, um, by reading two pages of Dr. Stein's book. Uh, and the reason I'm reading this book is because um, BTS, the K-pop group that is, is now number one with its new album, Map of the Soul Persona, based that album on this book. And so this is, I'm trying to support the BTS armies by helping them know what's in this book a little bit. And... Uh, talking about it, answering your questions, and so on. So this morning I'm going to be reading on symbols of the self just a couple of pages from Jung's Map of the Soul, an introduction by Dr. Murray Stein. And one of the traditional symbols of the self is a mandala. And mandalas are found everywhere that humans have been in the world in the earth uh, dr young found one, one example of a mandala that came from thirty-five thousand years ago in zimbabwe and so all of us know about mand mandalas uh, many of us may have in the past when we were young perhaps uh, been introduced to a kaleidoscope and a kaleidoscope is, every image in the kaleidoscope is typically a mandala. And you turn the kaleidoscope and it changes. And so everyone has a different view of the mandala and what it should look like. Uh, I'm providing here just an example, uh, just to give you a sense of it. But I'm going to, in a few minutes, I'm going to tell you something very interesting that came from uh, one of the smallest creatures on earth. Uh, but first I want to read what Dr. Jung, or I'm sorry, what Dr. Stein is saying. And so I'm on page 160 of this book and I'm reading Symbols of the Self. And I hope you can hear me all right. It seems to be broadcasting well. I've made some changes in my configuration and in my uh, cable network such that I shouldn't be having problems with stream health today, I'm hopeful. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so I'm going to read this section of the book, page 160, Symbols of the Self. Although the entire book is about the self, Ion has two chapters specifically on this subject. And when he refers to Ion, he's referring to this book. Ion researches into the phenomenology of the self by C.G. Jung. And I've completed a 32 week seminar on Ion. Uh, it's in our advanced reading group area. And so if you're interested in getting into this in great depth, uh, please contact me and I will uh, add you to the advanced reading group. Although the entire book is about the self, Ion has two chapters specifically on this subject. The first of these, chapter four, which we have just considered, is introductory. The book's final chapter, on the other hand, is perhaps Jung's most sophisticated and complete statement of the self. It assumes the intervening discussion of symbols from Gnosticism, astrology, alchemy, and I would add theology, 
which have threaded through manifestations of culture in the West over the past two millennia. This chapter begins by referring to the self as the archetype undergoing ego consciousness. Ego consciousness is the point of individual will, awareness, and self-assertion. Its function is to look out for the individual and to keep him or her alive. The ego, as I described in chapter one, is a complex that is organized around a dual center, a trauma and an archetype, the self. The talk about the self, to talk about the self, Jung now lists a host of possible images for it. Some of them are images that manifest in dreams or fantasies, and other, others appear in relationships and interactions with the world. Geometrical structures, such as the circle, the square, and the star, are u ubiquitous and frequent. These may appear in dreams without drawing special attention to themselves. People sitting around a round table, four objects arranged in a square space, a city plan, a home. Numbers, particularly the number four and the multiples of four, indicate quaternity structures. Jung was not so fond of the number three, which he regards as only a partial expression of the self. Three, quote, should be understood as a defective quaternity or as a stepping stone toward it." Unquote. He is more positive about threes and trinities in other passages, but mainly he views them as only the theoretical approximation to wholeness, which leaves out the concreteness and groundedness which wholeness requires. Other self-images are gemstones, like diamonds and sapphires, stones that represent high and rare value. Yet further self-representations include castles, churches, vessels, and containers, and of course, the wheel, which has a center and spokes radiating outward, ending in a circular rim. Human figures that are superior to the ego personality, such as parents, uncles, queens, kings, princes, and princesses are also possible self-representations. There are also animal images that symbolize the self, the elephant, the horse, the bull, the bear, the fish, and the snake. These are totem animals that represent one's clan or people. The collective is greater than the ego personality. The self may also be represented by organic images, such as trees and flowers, and by orga inorganic images, such as of mountains and lakes. Jung also mentions the phallus as a self symbol. Where there is an undervaluation of sexuality, the self is symbolized as a phallus. Undervaluation can consist in an ordinary repression or in overt devaluation. In certain differentiated persons, a purely biological interpretation and evaluation of sexuality can also have this effect. Jung blames Freud's excessively rationalistic attitude for his overemphasis over on sexuality. This led Jung to adopt a mystical attitude toward this instinct. The self contains opposites and has a paradoxical anonymial, that means amoral, character. It is male and female, old man and child, powerful and helpless, large and small. He might also have added good and evil. It is quite possible that the seeming paradox is nothing but a reflection of the enantiodromia changes of the conscious attitude, which can have a favorable or an unfavorable effect on the whole. In other words, the form in which the self is represented is influenced by the conscious attitude of the person regarding it. Changes in the conscious attitude could bring about shifts in the features of the self symbol. 
Now, um, he gets into some diagrams that Dr. Jung himself um, talked about. These are rather complicated, and I'm going to uh, do a second part of these symbols of the self tomorrow in which I discuss these diagrams, which are very complicated. But I want to share with you today something that you may find very interesting. And so what I'm going to do is take the mandala off, and instead I'm going to bring up uh, this image, which is also a mandala. But in this image, um, a kind of something happened in the deep sea. And uh, what you're seeing here is a mandala that divers started to notice in the Sea of Japan uh, in the 1990s, uh, but obviously it had been being put there for many, many, many years before that, uh, millennia, I'm sure. And so it was noticed by divers who were down about 100 feet and uh, they, they started to take pictures of it. And they're saying, how can this be? And you can think of the crop circles uh, from, uh, from um, Europe that sometimes emerge. And um, let's see, I wanna get myself back on the screen here. So let me make this a little bit smaller. Uh, but it's quite an interesting image, as I think you'll appreciate. And so they're trying to figure out what's creating these mandalas, since human beings create mandalas. And uh, we think of them through Dr. Jung's work as symbols of the self. But what in heaven's name is creating these mandalas? And so... Uh, divers started to watch for the answer, and the answer came in a very surprising way. Um, and it's this very small fish. Uh, it's called the puffer fish. And the puffer fish is the poisonous fish that is served in um, sushi restaurants in parts of Japan, and it needs to be prepared very carefully because if, it, if one uh, sack in this fish um, is cut by the chef, uh, then it will kill the patrons. <laughs> and so it's a delicacy in Japan, and it's called the puffer fish. It's five inches long. And when they create this mandala, um, it takes them five days to produce a mandala that's about seven feet in diameter. And the purpose of it is a mating ritual where the male puffer fish um, creates this mandala as an attraction to the female puffer fish. And then the puffer female uh, comes into the center of this mandala and lays her eggs and the male comes and fertilizes those eggs. But it's a way, it's a mating ritual. And so I thought that this would be uh, quite interesting to you because these symbols are obviously um, ancient in their origin. I mean, the, these had to come down uh, from fish like this for probably tens of thousands of years. So Dr. Jung was talking about uh, symbols of the self in the form of mandalas uh, being found in human experience 35,000 years ago in Zimbabwe. But obviously this, in order for this to be an instinctual activity of this five inch long fish, uh, it would have had to develop archetypally and at a very, very deep level and for many millions of years. And so that's my uh, surprising little story for today. And I'd like to 
know if you any of you have any comments or thoughts about this uh, either put them in the comments below this video or uh, we can have a chat about these things now on the chat um, and I see we have quite a number of folks listening to this presentation now so I'm just wondering if any of you have any questions or thoughts about symbols of the self now keep in mind that when Dr. Jung was talking about the self, he was talking about the deepest archetype in the unconscious that appears in all human beings. He called it the God image. And uh, let me give you back the diagram. Okay, so this is the diagram that was prepared by Dr. Edward Edinger for in this book, uh, The Ion Lectures by Edward F. Edinger. And um, Dr. Edinger uh, was able to diagram some of these things to help us because Dr. Jung didn't want to give too much rigidity to what he was talking about. So he never did much diagramming except uh, for uh, these diagrams that you see in this book here, uh, which I'll be ex explaining tomorrow. Um, but here you have the archetype of the self at the deepest layer of the unconscious, and it is in everyone, and Dr. Jung called it the God image or the religion making image in all human beings. And it doesn't matter whether you are an atheist or an agnostic, because if you, um, if you're a total rationalist, then very likely you're making money, which is the material world, uh, your God image. Um, and there's more to life than that, quite a bit more, as Dr. Stein explains in his book. And so uh, we'll be talking about that in the next few days. Kislev says, lately, I've been learning to read the Tarot just for Jung. That's a very good thing to do because the Tarot is filled with arch archetypal images, the major arcana. Um, represent archetypal things that happen to all of us. And so typically what happens is that um, in the first 10 cards, the zero card is the fool card. And typically the fool is stepping off into the unknown. And that is symbolic of a baby. Okay, a baby comes into the world, it has no clue what's going on. It just steps off into the world and all of a sudden, oh my God, I'm here and what, what am I supposed to do now? And, and so that's the, that's kind of the basic meaning of the fool card. I mean, you can find books and books on this and many, uh, probably thousands of different sets of tarot cards. Um, but, and... You know, I keep them nearby. I mean, here's here's a deck that I have uh, called the Wild Unknown Tarot, and uh, and then I have many other sets because people seem to like to give me tarot sets. <laughs> and um, but then the cards that are one through nine cover the major events of life, and. Then the 10th card uh, represents the uh, Wheel of Fortune, which can spin around and then you can come up the, the cards of life again. And then from card 11 on um, to, um, I think it's 20, uh, card 20, uh, you have this, your spiritual life, your life after the hero's journey, which begins, the hero's journey is when you're becoming 
a mature human being, which includes uh, reproducing and having children. So that's the hero's journey. Uh, but when you finish the hero's journey, uh, you still have some things to do in your psyche in terms of your spiritual life. And so if you imagine uh, the first episode of Star Wars, which is actually episode four, uh, you see at the end of that movie that Luke Skywalker is uh, marching into this great hall where all these people are standing at, a t at attention and he's cheered for be being a hero. And so Luke Skywalker is still a young guy at that time. And so then he has to do all the development to become a wise old man, which is uh, is the latter part of that. And, and that is really represented and understood in the second uh, part of the Major Arcana, uh, 11 through 20. Um, and, um, you know, then 21 uh, is um, the world, or um, it represents the culmination of everything in your life, basically. And then the minor arcana are the typical things uh, that happen to you in life. And um, so, you know, each one of those has, has different meanings, and I've done 18 videos on reading the Tarot, so I'm not going to try to do that here. Um, but the value of the Tarot, just for yourself, is to shake loose things that you may not be conscious of. So if you uh, do a reading, and you don't have to do it for anybody else, you just do it for yourself, and you can do a very brief reading. If you want to see what's upsetting you and you don't know, then probably there's something going on in your unconscious where you have a conflict going on. And if you do a reading, uh, that may help bring into consciousness uh, what's going on in your unconscious, which you can then work on it. Uh, and, and so at a very light stage, I, you can think of it as uh, psychotherapy light because obviously integrating things that are in your unconscious is a very valuable thing to do. Um, and uh, Kislev says not to know the future but as self-knowledge and that's exactly what I'm talking about because um, the as Dr. Young explained very graphically in one of his uh, interviews uh, the unconscious is really unconscious, and we can't, we don't necessarily, we get glimpses of it, uh, but we don't necessarily, we can't just say, hi, unconscious, now, now I'm ready to talk to you, let's communicate, it doesn't work that way. And so, uh, when you use the tarot as, uh, for yourself, as self-knowledge, what it does is, um, it shakes loose things in your unconscious and it brings them up so that you start thinking about them and that allows you to integrate them into your uh, conscious life, you know, for better or for worse. But, but it's, you know, if there's something that's bugging you, uh, then it's best to know what it is and then you can work out a way to deal with it. It might be a shadow element or something like that. And so if it's uh, in the shadow and you're not consciously aware of it, it's best to bring it into consciousness so that you can integrate that into your life. And so, um, so it's a very valuable thing to do readings um, for yourself and for others. I mean, I did a few readings for the President of the United States uh, a few months ago, and uh, they seem to be coming true, <laughs> uh, but they're true as of that date, and, and so um, you need to be doing this freshly so that it connects 
with what's going on now, not what was going on a year ago or something like that. Although it might give you a perspective on something that was going on a year ago, because in some layouts like the Celtic Cross layout, uh, you do get <laughs> you do get a a card for the, for past, and so it sometimes shakes loose something in your thinking about the past, and so you know a good tarot reader is simply flu fluent in what the cards mean at any given moment of time, um, but they. Um, but when a tarot reader reads, they have no idea what it actually means to you. And it means something to you at a very profound level. And so if you go to a tarot reader, it's, it's like a, a psychotherapist light, although they're not mental health professionals. And, but it can help you get over a depression or something like that because it can stir things up in your unconscious in such a way that it brings things up and then you can integrate those and bring those into life um, and then deal with them either um, you know control them if there's something evil but um, learn how to uh, understand them and one of the important things to understand is you have two streams coming up from your unconscious because everything it comes up in opposites and so anything that comes into consciousness immediately breaks into opposites and so it's very important to develop your ego through the job archetype this contest defeat lamentation and rebirth every time you go through that cycle you're going to make your ego stronger and it doesn't mean that you're going to uh, be reborn into something else as bts is an example they uh, had many defeats coming along in the last decade and what they did was they got stronger and then they emerged in a different way and as they emerge in a different way in each iteration, they get stronger and stronger and stronger. And that's the very, very powerful thing uh, that they have understood and many other musicians do not understand. And uh, if, if a musician or some artist of some kind gets it then you can make you go and you make lots of mistakes that's the objective make as many mistakes as you can and when you do you're either going to give up on that artistic venture or it's going to make you stronger in the artistic venture and uh, so that's why bts has emerged and that's why the television program the voice is so powerful because uh, most of us can't be rock stars to the truth be known but lots of us think that we can or we dream of being especially you know when we're in our early teens we dream of being a rock star perhaps and so lots of families have bought uh, electric guitars for their kids and their kids plunk on them for a period of time a year or two or maybe less but ultimately that electric guitar and the old amplifier ends up in the garage um, but what the what the voice does the program the voice is it it allows people that are modestly competent to get up and try and to see and to see what the competition is like and then if they're defeated if they lose the in the voice then they sort of say okay well i know i'm not going to be a, a superstar or maybe they they realize that they can be a superstar and you know if they have a little bit of success then they know well maybe i keep trying until i get to the top point 
and so it, it offers a great opportunity for this procedure of contest and defeat and you know for those that go on you know even the winners of the voice they have to keep going i mean it's not you don't automatically become a rock star just because you won on the on the voice because you know after 10 or 11 or 12 seasons now of that program um you know the the rock stars that are the judges on the voice are still the rock stars in society as well and um and so you know a winner on the voice still has has to face the competition which is pretty fierce in the in the music industry and you know obviously there'll be lots of me too copycats of bts of people who think they've followed the formula of bts and tried to ride that wave um, but most will fail and um, and so it's important for the bts members to continue to evolve and and get stronger based on whatever happens to them in their life and to their great credit as i understand this because i've talked to a few bts armies now um, the that's what they're doing through all of their albums which is showing their development as young men and uh, it's very very powerful idea that they're presenting uh, and so it's worth understanding and it's worth getting your mind around i hope all of you can do that and so Ken kislev says do you know what the new track is for the new BTS album? Uh, I don't know. I mean, there's seven new tracks. I don't know what you mean by your question. Um, could you tell us? Uh, I'm not. If there's a new track beyond the seven that are in the album, I don't know of that. I'm not aware of that. So. Um, if somebody would inform me, that would be good. <laughs> uh, but I'm not sure what you mean by the new track in the new BTS album. Um, but in any case, okay. Uh, please, uh, if you're watching this video and you know something about this, please put a comment underneath the video so that I can be brought up to speed on it um, and uh, I'm going to assume that that um, Kislev may have some ideas but may also not be a native English speaker so um, it may be difficult to have this conversation through YouTube okay so it's uh, 10 30 here and uh, my hometown and we seem to have had good stream health throughout this entire presentation and my OBS seems to be working again finally <laughs> and so um, okay Kislev says youth never come back okay I'm going to have to look at, at that because I'm not familiar with that um, but you know obviously that's a fact of life you have to live your youth and it won't come back that oh that's the clue okay well the clue is that you're you're never going back you have you have to keep uh, evolving further in your life and so in terms of the tarot cards basically um you know the first 10 cards the first 10 cards in the major arcana the one through nine um, or the one through ten let's say represent life going on and in including the wheel of fortune and so you never get back to the point of origin where you were born and you have to go forward and so it's a bit like the story of peter pan you know the 
Peter Pan and the Lost Boys never wanted to grow up. And unfortunately, that's not the way life works. You have to grow up and assume a role in society one way or another. And that was the purpose of your birth, to uh, assume a role in society and make your contribution to society, whatever that may be. There's no specific prescription in terms of what your role in society is because you have to look at your own um, situation, your gender and your um, your education and where you landed in the world. And all of us are lottery winners because the, you and me, we're all one in, one in billions. Okay, think of all the... Um, chances that you could have been uh, not born <laughs> and um and so we're we're all one in billions and so the fact that we're in the physical world and we might be in poverty really doesn't mean very much because if you're a human being you've already won the lottery now the question is what are you going to do with what you were given as a human being and with that um, all of us are pretty much equal on the day we're born and so you have to pull from the assets that are around you and you have to pull yourself up by your bootstraps until you're able to make a contribution in society and you may have setbacks you do have setbacks all of us do uh, i certainly have had many and so um but you need to you know go out try something new if that doesn't work and it puts you off if in your lamentation you realize well maybe i shouldn't have been doing that and then you get reborn into something new i've re had to reinvent myself many times and uh, but somehow now i'm here with you trying to help you understand how you will evolve and you know that is a that's a it seems to me it's a valuable thing in the world uh and i've done 925 videos that tell me that myself the my deep unconscious is telling me this is the most important thing you could be doing with your life right now and that's what it's telling me it doesn't mean you should do that maybe you should start a youtube channel that's entirely possible and when i started it seemed like a monumental task to get it going and and nothing much happened in the first year um but then um when i started three years ago to do the young material it gradually started and you just begin i mean i started with one follower on twitter um nine years ago when I started on Twitter I started with one follower and now I have uh, 35,000 so you have to begin and take step by step um, so uh, Kislev says youth never comes back um, army thinks it's the theme that will be in the next album and that may very well be true and that's a message that we learn when we have to step into adulthood that uh, you know you can't go back you you know there's the Oedipus complex which doesn't is the only complex is the only archetype that Dr. Freud discovered but he didn't quite get its depth meaning uh, because he thought it meant uh, the desire of a young person to uh, return to the womb and to be a lover of your mother um, but in in full retrospect a century retrospect more than now um, we understand that to mean that you know when you encounter difficulties uh, you want to go back into the to the family to the nuclear family because then it, all your all your um, needs were taken care of by your parents and 
So many people want to return to that nuclear family, and that's what Peter Pan is about, where Peter Pan wants to not grow up. And, um, but that's not an option. And so uh, ultimately we, we were born for the purpose of making a contribution to the human species. And we all have grandparents going back millions of generations back to um, single-celled organisms that have successfully reproduced in every generation from single cells to you. And so, you know, that's a pretty awesome responsibility when you think about it, because all of your parents and grandparents going all the way back um, successfully reproduced and successfully raised the next generation so that ultimately you could exist. And so now it's your turn and now you're, um, you've finished your growing up time and now it's time to find a mature contribution to the world. It doesn't mean you're gonna get the right answer right away. I mean, you, you try something and that's your experiment. You try to do something that you think you want to do and chances are you find out that that isn't going to be the way you're going to proceed for one reason or another. Um, so when I was growing up, uh, my father had been a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy, and I would say, I'm going to Annapolis, which meant to me that I was going to go to the Naval Academy. But as you see, I wear spectacles, and during the Vietnam War, they were very careful about vision and so they I couldn't get into the Naval Academy because of my vision and uh, so that was that was a defeat for me and I still pressed forward and since I couldn't go to the Navy and I, and I couldn't go to Navy OCS for the same reason because of vision at that time so that's how they were uh, weeding people out in the Navy and so I ended up in the Marine Corps and I stayed in the Marine Corps for 23 years um, but ultimately that wasn't my destiny either and I slipped and fell and broke my leg in uniform and that was the last thing I did in uniform in officially in on active duty and so then I had to reinvent myself again and figure out what was going to be next. And it happened over and over again in my lifetime. So, um, and that, all of those things led me to this, to what I'm doing now, which is that Dr. Jung helped me to mature and individuate throughout the last 32 years of my life. And so I find that of great value to me personally. And that's why I've been doing this YouTube channel for three years and intend to keep doing it. So, um, so all of us need to see if we can get in touch with this deep unconscious archetype that's within all of us. We need to make our experiment, make our mistakes, when we get stopped, when we it, it's kind of like going through a maze, okay? You're going through a maze and you run into an obstacle. Then you have to find your way out of that obstacle and in, into the next thing you're going to try. And you keep trying until you find your way out of the maze. And so, excuse me, so life is like a maze in a way that, you know, you're going into it. You don't know what obstacles you're going to run into. When you run into an obstacle, you have to uh, change your plan, try the next thing, and you keep doing that throughout life until you get to the end. <laughs> and that's the way it works. So uh, anyway, I hope that's helpful. And those are my thoughts for today. Uh, so I'm going to move on because I do have my advanced reading group 
seminar this afternoon at 1.30. If you're interested in that uh, seminar, um, I would uh, feel happy to be happy to have you join us. Um, it, we already have 32 seminar sessions on video in, on ION, and we, today will be the 12th session that we're doing on Mysterium Conjunctionis, which is Dr. Jung's uh, last major book. And uh, so the first 11 sessions are also available in the advanced group place. So when you're ready, you can contact me and join the advanced reading group. And uh, also, um, I'd be happy if you'd please support this YouTube channel by uh, sharing the, share the videos, please. And uh, subscribe and click on the little bell so that you get notified when we go online live. I'd appreciate that. And also, uh, I'd be very grateful if either in chats and super chat, uh, you would buy me a cup of coffee or uh, f subscribe to, m to me on Patreon. Uh, because already, um, just because we found the um, we found uh, the BTS armies and the need that's there for people to understand what's happening. Uh, thanks to BTS, um, you know it's it's getting quite costly for me to to um, add the technology that I need to to support um, your needs. So uh, if you can, if you have it within your wherewithal to. Uh, support my activities. I would be very grateful for that. Raman says, what do you think about the quote, reality is the line that rival gangs of shamans have fought to a standstill? Um, well, I mean, you can talk about that in terms of, um, you know, the religious attitude and religions and um, the fundamental problem is that uh, rival groups of shamans, gangs of shamans, have gotten themselves into my idea, my way or the highway and saying that, you know, it's my way and the other side is wrong. But and so traditionally that's how uh, religious wars have developed. But the reality is that all of these things are pointing at the same thing. They're all pointing at the self. And this is what Dr. Jung emphasized. And let me, um, since we're talking about it, I will put again uh, the link to Dr. Uh, Edinger's interview where he explains that um, what Jung did was he, this, okay, so this is um, Edinger's interview, so I'll put it on here. And thank you, Destiny, for the super chat. I'll look at your comment in a moment. Um, but um, this is, Dr. Edinger's interview that I uh, took the time to um, which I took the time to transcribe because it's hard to follow and um, so you can uh, go and take a look at that but Dr. Edinger said that Jung reached the source of all religions and if you realize what it is that he found, uh, then you can say, well, how can we, um, how can we learn from the others? In other words, instead of looking at the differences between religions or between rival group gangs of shamans, if you will, as you correctly point out, um, instead of looking at those differences, let's look at how they're similar and what one may have learned that the other didn't get 
and how we can improve things. Instead of looking at our differences, let's look at our similarities, and especially in things like shamanism or religion or whatever, because we can learn things. I give, I'll give you an example, a very specific example, which is uh, the comparison between Christianity and Islam. Um, what uh, could we as Christians learn from Muslims? Well, how about prayer five times a day? Okay, that's a, uh, that seems like a, a small thing, but, you know, taking 10 minutes off or 15 minutes off to recharge your psyche, uh, no matter what you think of prayer, it's at least that, and taking the pressure off your conscious mind uh, five times a day, what could be wrong with that? That's a, that's a brilliant idea. And uh, I've done a lot of work in uh, Muslim countries, and I've been to Saudi Arabia 23 times. I've been to many business meetings in Saudi Arabia, and it's very common at prayer time for Saudi businessmen to go off to pray. I have to pray right now. And you know, what it is for me, since I'm not Muslim and ha haven't adopted that that attitude, um, it's a sort of a time for contemplation, but, you know, Muslims have a very specific thing that they do during their prayer time, but, you know, what could be wrong with doing that? And so uh, we have to stop giving power to rival gangs of shamans um, who are saying, I'm right and he's wrong. Instead, let's say, well, I have my ideas, but what could I learn from, um, from the other approaches? You know, what can we learn from a tarot reader? What can we learn from an astrologer? What can we learn from a tea reader? <laughs> you know, what can we learn from uh, Dr. Jung's cousin who was communicating with the dead. Uh, all of those, all of those things are real things that have their value. Um, and if we, we decide that we're going to try to learn from them, then we're going to be empowered. And just as how can we learn uh, from BTS, for example? Um, you know, and what they're doing. Well, one thing that most popular musicians are going to want to do is figure out what BTS has done in terms of doing their albums based on philosophical books, for example, or psychological books. And so they did their album Wings based on... Um, based on Damien, as I understand it, which is a not, it's an outstanding novel by Herman Hesse, and he was influenced by Dr. Jung. And another album uh, was based on um, uh, Ursula Le, Le Guin's book, or story, uh, Leaving Omelas. And, um, you know, you need to look into those stories to see the meaning of what she was addressing. But what what BTS is doing is pulling the meanings of these books into their albums and making the rest of us understand those meanings. And what we see by BTS's success is that there's a huge, huge demand for this. People really want to learn. And uh, in many societies, we are we are unable to learn. I mean, even in the United States, we we have people in the one percent who think it's perfectly fine uh, if all we teach people to do is uh, balance their che checkbook, add and subtract, and write a little bit so they can sign checks, and that's it. Then just put them over in the corner and let them operate like robots and not think too much. Um, and, you know, that's a terrible idea, but that's an idea that's in 
uh, society right now. And so they've taken art, for example, and music out of the curriculum in public education in many places. And that's a complete wrong thing to do because um, what that does is it creates a society that's no longer creative. And if it's not creative, it's, it's going to succeed as long as this logical block works. But when other societies go around you, then you're going to see that you're left flat-footed, which is what BTS has done. Okay, they've, they've basically uh, said, well, there's more and we can do more, and this is how we're going to do it. And now they're doing it, and now they're having this tr phenomenally successful uh, concert tour coming up in, in May, and, um, and everybody's flat-footed. Okay, they're just leaving the current pop music industry behind, uh, and and everybody's going to have to scramble to catch up. I don't know what the result will be going forward, but I'm very respectful and thankful to BTS for what they're doing for Dr. Jung's study, and um, and I'm certainly going to promote what they're doing uh, and you know all other musicians and and artists around the world have to take take a page out of their book and try to um, try to learn from that so anyway let me go back destiny thank you so much for your contribution I appreciate that I hope that answered your question Brahman uh, Orchid MSC says, I appreciate your time. And uh, Edinger's, okay, that's my uh, pointer at the uh, Edinger interview. And Kislev says, prayer is like meditation, and that's good for the self. Absolutely. And I go for, to a, um, now, I seem to have a bad connection now, according to my, um, according to my OBS, things are not going well. So, I'm going to uh, terminate this for now, but, um, you know, meditation and prayer are very important things, and you should consider those and learn how to meditate if you don't know how. Meditation doesn't have to be have any significance vis-a-vis -vis, um, a religion, okay? You can just meditate and get connected with yourself, which is why I do it, okay, very definitely. Um, so I'm going to excuse myself now because I see the stream health is uh, deteriorating, uh, so I'm going to... Uh, Con, uh, conclude and I will see you tomorrow for further access to this information. So thank you for joining me today. And thank you so much, Destiny. I appreciate that. And Orchid MSC, thank you for your contribution as well. I appreciate it.